very much for taking time to talk to us today. This conference we're at in Salzburg is, um, has a position paper saying that in the developed world, particularly the US, we've created an industrial medical complex, as it were, which pulls people into this highly technological, highly specialized, very expensive healthcare. Um, in more resourceful settings where there's fewer funds available, healthcare is a more sort of community-based approach um, with health workers rather than doctors. You were in Mexico, that's where, where you started off your career. So on that continuum, where does Mexico lie at the moment? The, <coughs> the, the realities you're describing have a global impact. Mexico is a middle-income country and, and um, it is a continuum. But um, so you know, it would lie somewhere in the middle uh, of that continuum as a middle-income country. It is also a country with great internal inequities. So whereas you do have, particularly in urban areas, highly specialized tertiary hospitals, you then in the in the remote rural areas you barely have any any facilities. And I think this is a reality you see throughout the world. Uh, but I think what's happening now is that we're moving away from the more classical view of health systems as a pyramid with a base of primary care, then a middle part of secondary general hospitals, and then a small component of tertiary high specialty care. And we're moving more into a vision of the health system as, as a network, um, where technology is, uh, is pervasive, but it serves different purposes according to, to where you stand in that network. So, in my mind, uh, of course, we have bio, biomedical technology, drugs and vaccines, that's um, our staple sort of technology. But increasingly, the most important uh, technologies to, to energize this network view of the health system are communication and information technologies. And today, I think that the, the old dichotomy of a small set of elite urban hospitals highly technified, and then this broad base of primary centers, community-based, with low level of technology. That, I think, is being challenged, because today what we have is the opportunity to link those two extremes of the continuum through applications uh, in telemedicine, and then increasingly through the power of, of mobile phone technology, which is now you know, becoming a, a very much a technology in the hands of poor families. Um, there's about two billion uh, cell phones in the world in, in, in developing countries and uh, increasingly these are in the hands of poor families. So I, I think where we're heading is to, to moving away from this view of the two extremes of a, continu of a continuum and rather trying to think about networks because you know um, we need to rethink primary care. Primary care is not primitive care. Uh, primary care ought to have the appropriate technologies to link up when that responds to patient needs. Um, and increasingly what you see is that poor people not only are suffering from acute infections, but increasingly they're also suffering from chronic uh, non-communicable diseases. Uh, and therefore, assuring access to the expertise without replicating this um, uh, high technology in every part of a country, which would not be feasible even in the richest country. That's, I think, the challenge. So I, I am um, extremely uh, optimistic about the power of, of telecommunications and especially of what's now being called mHealth to link uh, the community-based primary centers uh, all the way to the most specialized care and, and making you know, sure that we, we, we move away from an idea which was pre very prevalent in the early days of the primary care movement. It's basically the idea that, that poor people had to have poor services. Mm. Th that is not true. Uh, I, I think you know, today, bearing in mind that the pathological mix of poor people is now also includes diseases that we previously thought were exclusive of affluent countries or populations, we need to make sure that uh, through this technological means they can connect and have available the expertise uh, at, at uh, all levels of the health system. And, and if we move away 
from, from, from this pyramidal view into a network view, uh, then we, I think, can, can bridge the access barriers that um, affect remote populations. Sure. Is there anyone, any particular country or area that, that's leading in that at the moment? There's many, many uh, experiments going on now. I mean, I can tell you that in, in my country, in Mexico, which uh, when I was Minister of Health, I mean, we were facing the paradox of having some of the largest urban areas in the world, Mexico City, for example, with close to 20 million people in its metropolitan area, while at the same time having over 100,000 communities with less than, than 1,000 people each. So, you, you know, we have this simultaneous, apparently paradoxical presence of high urban concentrations and great rural dispersion. Again, this is, this is a pervasive phenomenon now in poor countries. Some of the largest uh, megalopolis that are being built now and, and are growing are in Asia and, and in Africa, while at the same time you have large rural communities. We need to create the means for people in remote populations to actually link up according to their needs. I think the, what we need to stop is the abuse of technologies, but that happens at all levels of, of a health system. You know, if, if someone at the primary level is over-prescribing antibiotics, that's as much a threat as, uh, you know, doing too many CT scans in the large urban hospital. The key th thing here is the appropriate use of technologies, which means technologies that are appropriate to the needs of people. And, and then, you know, if someone in a poor remote community needs the highest technological intensity we can have, health systems need to assure the access of those people to those technologies. But it's, it's, the, it's the idea of appropriate technology that I think um, is a relevant one. Sure. And you said there that there's kind of lots of experimentation going on in this way. Do you think we're quite far from, from creating any society or any network of health in, in the way that you described? We're still far because, you know, uh, particularly when you go to developing countries, you have these very rigid levels of care with very clumsy referral systems. So very often what happens, for example, in maternal mortality is, is a woman in labor makes it to the primary level, but then there's a, a complication which is very often unpredictable. And there's just no way to, to, for her to be referred in a timely manner and, and the woman dies in the process of being referred from one level to the other. I think this is what we need to break. People should be channeled to the level of care that's most appropriate to their needs. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I envision a day when the community health worker will have in, in her, you know, toolkit a mobile phone with capability for, for image transmission uh, that would allow her to be in touch with a high-level specialty in an urban hospital to deal with a patient that happens to be there in that community and that maybe needs to be stabilized before that person can be referred to a hospital. Um, the idea that you isolate these levels, um, which is you know, the, still the most common reality in most health systems, is I think what we need to, to fight against. It's a networked uh, system where, where primary doesn't mean primitive, and, and where we actually, as I say, assure access according to the need. Is there any country that has achieved that? No, I don't think so yet, but I think uh, there's you know, interesting um, uh, reforms going on throughout the world, and what we need to do is assure a process of shared learning so that every time a country introduces an innovation, the rest of the world stands to benefit and learn from that experience. Sure. Now, this conference is about uh, finding out what countries can learn together, whether they have a developed or a developing healthcare system. Um, when you were Minister for Health in Mexico, did you look to the UK, Europe, US, places with a developed healthcare system, or did you take inspiration from, from other places? I, I became Minister um, after having devoted about uh, 20 years to studying health systems. So when I got there, I, I had a, a a fairly good idea of w what things were going on in the world. And um, to answer your question, I looked around everywhere. There were interesting models in the developed world. Uh, you know, the UK, the, through, through the National Health Service, I've always said it's, the UK is like a laboratory in health systems innovation for the rest of the world. Um, the UK being a publicly funded system was much more relevant for Mexico 
let's say the United States. If anything, the U.S. offered us um, examples of what not to do, uh, particularly the idea of mostly relying on private insurance, which I think has introduced introduces a number of, of difficulties in any health system. Um, so th th this all, uh, is only to say that you know there are also examples. Of, of failure that we also need to study so that people don't repeat the same mistakes. But I looked intensely to some of the European countries. I always found that countries, uh, the Central and Eastern European countries in transition were offered very interesting models because Mexico was also going through a massive political transition from basically a one-party system into a, a, a true democracy, which is what we enjoy today. And, I was honored to serve in, 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 in a government that was really the first uh, fully democratic government, the result of a fully democratic election. So, um, so there were lessons there as well. How do you manage health reform when all of a sudden you now have a, a plurality of decision-making points? And then I looked at many, many developing countries. I draw lots of inspiration from the very uh, innovative reforms carried out in the country of Colombia in South America. I looked at Thailand from so, for some of their uh, health car, card innovations in, in health insurance. I looked at Africa, um, the, the experience in Ghana and, and in South Africa were, were also inspirational. Uh, I think today we need to create these learning opportunities and learning now flows in all directions. Um, uh, you know, it's not just as Lord Crisp has very eloquently uh, argued in his book, it's now, not now only that you know, developing countries have to learn from developed countries. There are many innovations going on now in developing countries that could also benefit developed countries. So we're in a much more plastic global scene. Uh, I personally found examples from the highly developed countries for countries in transition, like countries in Central and Eastern Europe, and many, many countries from my own region of Latin America, but also I found this horizontal learning across regions. Um, you know, WHO is organized still by geographic regions, and when I worked there, I kept arguing that sometimes the most interesting dialogue that can happen is an interregional dialogue. And then conversely, when we started developing our own reform efforts in Mexico, I have to tell you that I hosted delegations from uh, about 50 or 60 countries, many of them headed by the Minister of Health. We were honored by the presence of the Minister of Health of China and the Minister of Health of Iran and the Minister uh, 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 of Health of, of many countries in, in, in Asia. We, were, we hosted high-level delegations from South Africa, and of course, from our neighbors in, in Latin America as well. So in, in our globalized world, it's not geographic proximity. It's the fact that we, I think there's a convergence of problems, and we need to be able to derive global lessons and then have the local capacity not to adopt, but to adapt the lessons that come from other parts of the world. And, and, and th this is, I think, what, what we ought to facilitate, what the global uh, community should facilitate this process of shared learning. Uh, I don't think we have those facilitating mechanisms. I was able to carry out that exercise of learning because I had been studying health systems. But this is not always uh, information that's available to every minister of health in the world. So how to create a repository of best practice where everybody can tap into that and can also contribute into that common pool of knowledge uh, through good evaluative studies of their own reform initiatives. I think that, that would go a long ways in improving health worldwide. Sure. Now, you mentioned there how uh, lessons should flow in all directions. And that's a, a question that uh, Lord Chris put to you at the end of uh, his interview. He said, from your experience in Mexico, thinking as the Minister of Health there, what would you be saying to Americans that they should be doing at the moment? What can they borrow from Mexico? Well, again, I would say more than borrow. I think the, the, the issue here is to adapt rather than adopt. But, you know, obviously Mexico and the U.S. are very different countries. Um, but the interesting issue is that both of them had the same, have had the same underlying issue. When I became Minister of Health in Mexico, the problem we had was that health insurance was a benefit of employment. So access to insurance was tied to holding a salary job. Mm. Now that's exactly the same problem as we have in the United States. 
It's exactly the same problem that many other countries in the world have. And then what happens is, not surprisingly, that everyone who's self-employed, who's unemployed, or who's completely out of the labor market because, you know, that person is a, is a full-time homemaker or a full-time student uh, or is retired, yeah. those people are excluded from insurance. So the big reform in Mexico was to disentangle to untie the dependency of health insurance from, fa from formal employment, salaried employment. And instead of thinking about health insurance as a, as, a, as, a, as a benefit of employment, think of health insurance as a citizen, citizen's right. It's a right of citizenship. It's not a benefit of employment. That's exactly the essence of the health reform that was passed in the United States uh, uh, last year. And that we very much hope will not, you know, will not be uh, repealed or will go backwards because that, 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 that's exactly the right direction. What I would would say are are interesting examples of, of of Mexico, for other countries, is the need to have this prior discussion uh, about how do we think about access to health care? Is it a merchandise? Uh, something that is to, you know, is part of the reward system. So whoever has more money gets more of that reward. Is it a privilege or a benefit of having a, a job? Or is it a right? And it, the United States has not fully carried out that, which is more an ethical and political debate, not so much a technical debate. In Mexico, we started with that discussion, and we concluded that health insurance should not be a benefit of employment, a privilege for those who have a job, but a right of citizenship. And we amended our constitution to declare explicitly that this is a right. Once you do that discussion, you carry out that discussion, once you have that social consensus, then you can design the technical aspects of a reform that better respond to your own realities. But, but, but this is, you know, every reform has an ethical component and and a political component. And if we don't take those into account, I think we miss some of the most important issues. Now, within that, on the technical front, I think we introduced a number of innovations. One of them, which I also see now reflected in the health reform in the United States, and I applaud that, is to go beyond health insurance. I had studied other examples, and one negative example that I found in many countries was that countries expanding health insurance would then neglect basic public health and preventive services because you're so worried with provided financial protection for people who need a, a complex treatment that you forget about the upstream preventive intervention. So in our case in Mexico, we established a separate fund for community health services that funded campaigns like immunizations or early detections, detection campaigns. One thing that I applaud of the US reform that was passed by the Congress uh, at the initiative of President Obama is the fact that it includes a major component of community-based uh, services. And, and, and that, I think, is, is, um, is another positive example uh, to share with the rest of the world. It's not enough to extend insurance, although that's very important. You also need to think about the upstream interventions that will, that will prevent people from getting sick in the first place. Sure. I think you mentioned there a little bit about um, the new uh, healthcare um, funding uh, that's, that's taking place in the US. And I'm sure everyone who's here has seen the opposition that there was to that, um, the idea of, sort of socialized healthcare. Uh, do you think there's actually any hope of the US in particular taking on some of these, these lessons from elsewhere? Well, you know, it was very interesting in the in the health de reform debate here. How, how often uh, the the experience of other countries was brought to the to the debate. Um, you know, sometimes to contrast the fact that the U.S. being the only industrialized country without universal insurance, that was a motivating factor in the debate. Also, contrasting the fact that you know the U.S. is the industrialized country with the highest expenditure both as a percentage of GDP, but also the highest expenditures per capita, whereas some of its indicators really lag behind 
other developed uh, countries. Um, <clears throat> I was very much engaged in the exercise carried out in the year 2000 by WHO of trying to measure health system performance and you know the rankings that came out of that and had the US um, you know somewhere around number 37 that number was quoted in the debate so people were very aware about the need to to benchmark against other developed countries um, now granted also there was a lot of misinformation and in, in you know in creating a little bit of a scare around health reform people would tell horror stories about waiting lists in the UK that really were not are not borne out by by solid evidence they were anecdotal stories so you know this can cut both ways we need to make sure that public debate is informed by solid evidence not by anecdotal uh, stories that then is manipulated for political purposes and having sound evidence I think is a crucial part of any reform effort the other key part of any reform effort here or, or anywhere else is to um, evaluate what we do and I would say that one lesson also from Mexico is we built in a strong evaluation component from the beginning. Um, and I would say this is a lesson that can apply to any country in the world. Evaluation is important so that you can correct the course as the reform gets implemented. But it's also important to legitimize, to show that the reform is actually working. We went through a change of administration in Mexico you know, the administration in which I served came to its end. We had election, we had a new government. And very often what you see in developing countries is that then reforms that were enacted by a previous government, you'll get interrupted because there's a new government. I saw how having done good external evaluation, very solid from a methodological point of view, served to persuade the new government that this was a reform that had to be continued. Engaging the public in these decisions and discussions with good evidence I think it's also a way of protecting the continuity of reforms. And that, I would say, is, is um, something that every country, rich or poor, can do and should do. It's also a way of then building this knowledge base that other countries can, can benefit from. Sure. And just finally, on that knowledge base, uh, do you have any ideas about how we could best build that? Yes, I think... Um, you know, uh, we, we, we need to think of knowledge as a global public good. Uh, and then we need to have, you know, credible, independent sources of that knowledge. There are several of those now around the world. You know, I was very involved in the creation of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is affiliated with the University of Washington, but it's, a, it's a, you know, an independent entity now providing constant sources of, inform of information and, and, and evaluation. There are other similar initiatives. I do think um, that we need to build up a repository of, of best practice that would be a global resource. Uh, I think uh, those would be best placed in academic institutions working in close collaboration with governments and with international agencies. But they have to have the credibility of being um, independent a little bit like what we have seen, for example, with the Cochrane collaboration for yeah. clinical interventions, where they you know, add the value of synthesizing evidence. I think we need something of, of that nature for um, health systems intervention, whether they're facility-based, you know, take electronic medical records. There's a lot to be learned, and it would be great to have a repository where you can actually turn to and find good knowledge but also broad systemic I I interventions like health insurance. What kind of health insurance? Or, you know, many countries are <clears throat> need to revamp the regulatory side of the health system, which we tend to lose sight of. In Mexico, part of the health reform was to create a whole new public health agency, for example, to regulate the drug industry because we were going to expand insurance. It included a pharmaceutical benefit. We needed to make sure that we had the ways of ensuring that we had high quality generics, which was a big part. So this upstream more uh, sort of interventions that we, that are not part of the healthcare uh, component of the health system, but are very, very central. Um, you know, all the issues around uh, environmental uh, uh, health, uh, food safety, this is a core part of the health system, not just the healthcare part. We need good repositories of what has worked where. 
And that should be a global resource with the authority of, of uh, academic institutions, but very, very much connected to decision makers around the world in countries at all levels of development, being very responsive to their needs for evidence, and then working to aggregate value, to add value to the information. It's not just a matter of collecting information. It's a, it's a matter of synthesizing it in a way that a decision maker uh, can, as I say, take that knowledge and then adapt it to uh, the challenges that he or she is facing in, in, in the particular context that uh, he or she has to, to reform or is, is, uh, the challenges that, that they are facing. Great. Well, Professor Frank, thank you very much for your insights today. Thank you.